الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد As it has been announced, this session is a session in which the backdrop for it was the observation and the determination of what our mother Aisha radiallahu anha understood from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's behavior. In an authentic ather when she was questioned as to the akhlaq of the Prophet وسلم, his character she gave a comprehensive answer and that comprehensive answer came as a direct result of her being trained schooled educated and receiving the tarbiyah of the Sayyid of Bani Adam and the Khatim of the NB and the Rasul, Salawatullahi Wasalamu Ali. It was the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it was from his good akhlaq that he was an articulate individual. So when they asked her how was his akhlaq, she could have easily said he had good character. But because again she was trained by him. She spent a lot of time with him. It's not strange that in answering that question, her answer was reflective of the way he used to teach, sallallahu alayhi wa So that's a classic case of how the wife benefits from the husband and the husband benefits from the wife. And we benefit from each other in terms of spending quality time with people and you take away from them those things that embellish who you are as an individual. Her answer was, his khuluq was the Qur'an. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His character was the Qur'an. So everything that the Qur'an commanded, he was the first person for that thing to be embodied within him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of the superlatives that are positive, all of the descriptions that are positive, all of the characteristics that are positive, that all human beings accept and embrace as being positive, they were embodied in the character of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was brave, he was forbearing, he was gentle, he was patient, he was articulate, he was intelligent, he sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam was serious, he was on time, he was balanced, he didn't over talk. Everything that you can possibly think of in terms of positive characteristics, he brought it to the table sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was wise. He had hikmah, he was hakim. And one of the concepts that I want you brothers and sisters to walk away from this talk today, if you don't walk away with anything else, is the definition of hikmah as given by the scholars of Islam. The scholars of Islam, they said that hikmah is putting things in the proper place. We translate it as being wise, and it is that but it's putting things in the proper place knowing what to say when to say it how to say it who to say it to the prophet was like that sallallahu alaihi wasallam he knew when to be tough he knew when to be easy he knew when to take the initiative and he knew when to be passive he knew when to be quiet he knew sallallahu alaihi wasallam how to put things in the proper place allah azawajal is al hakim he knows who to bestow riches upon that individual. And he knows who to not bestow riches upon. He is Hakim. The halal and the haram of Al-Islam is from the hikmah of Allah. When he allowed the man, for an example, to have more than one wife, he was wise. So the woman should never come and say, I wish I could have more than one husband. Allah was wise. 
and making haram haram and halal halal. The Nabi was like that, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Meaning, he put everything in the proper place, and no one can come and accuse him of not doing that. So the point here is, his character was the Quran, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Every positive characteristic, he had it. The other side of the coin has to be mentioned as well in being balanced. Every characteristic of the Quran that was negative, the Prophet was the furthest person away from it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the Prophet used to stay, say in the Quran, like the Nabi of Islam, Shu'aib, when he told his people, وَلَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَالِفُكُمْ أَمَّا أَنْهَاكُمْ عنه. I don't want to go against what I'm prohibiting you people from. That's what Shu'aib said to his people. I don't want to tell you not to do this, this, that, and that, and then I myself fall into it. So all of the negative, superlatives, characteristics that have been mentioned in the Quran, all of what human beings see as being negative, the Nabi was the furthest person away from it, sallallahu alayhi wa He wasn't a liar. He, sallallahu alayhi wa wasn't selfish. He wasn't self-centered. He wasn't a coward. He, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wasn't an individual who said one thing and did another thing. And that's the way we want to tackle today's subject. We don't want to come here and tell you, brothers and sisters, about those ayat and those ahadith that tell us about the importance of character. Like what Allah mentioned and described about Al-Mustafa Al-Mukhtar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Innaka la'ala khuluqin azim Verily you, Ya Muhammad, you're on a high and exalted level of character. That's what Allah established in one of the many ayat of the Qur'an. Many, many, many. He said in the authentic hadith, Sayyid al-Bukhari Muslim, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Athqalu shayfin mizan al-husn al-khuluq the heaviest thing, Yomul Qiyamah, in the scales. Allah created some scales, and part of what Ahl Sunnah has to believe in is that there are some scales. There is a scale that Allah created, a scale, like when you go to the store and you want a kilo of oranges or other than that. In that scale, things will be placed. The human being will be placed in that scale. So if the lady takes from her eyebrows, it's going to affect the scale. The man takes from his lihya is going to affect in the scale. If he or she eats haram, is going to be affected in the scale. Good deeds will be put in the scale. Your dhikr of Allah will be put in the scales. He said the heaviest thing in the scale is having good akhlaq, having good character. Good character. Being patient, being forbearing, being a person who minds your own business, being an individual who says what you mean and mean what you say. Being an individual who, again, as we mentioned earlier, he's doing those things that the Quran told him to do, and he's abandoning or she's abandoning what the Quran and the Sunnah told them to abandon. So you want to take a characteristic of negativity because it's prevalent, and most people have to deal with it. That guy over there has to deal with it. Everyone sitting here has to deal with it. The people were driving around us, they have to deal with it. And it is a characteristic that the Nabi was far, far, far away from. It's against good character. And it was something that he came, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, to fight against. And the deen has given us ample examples and proofs as to the danger of this issue. And that is, from the good character of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he was not a lazy individual. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't a person who procrastinated. He was an individual who took the initiative to get the job done, whatever the job happened to be. Procrastination and laziness is a characteristic of the munafiqeen in the Quran. It's not a characteristic of the person who believes in Allah and his messenger. The student who's in the university, laziness and procrastination will adversely impact upon the result of your exams. Even if you were to get a good grade, 
You could have gotten a better grade had you not been lazy, had you not procrastinated. The person from amongst you, man or woman, who has a desire to be a serious student of knowledge, you want to memorize the Quran, you want to be a religious student of knowledge, procrastinating and being lazy will go against you being successful. The father who's in the house or other than that, being lazy about getting things done around the house. Where I live at in the UK right now, the UK is a society that is built upon welfare, welfare. The vast majority of Muslims in the UK don't work and they receive welfare. Although the Nabi, he told the people sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the upper hand is better than the lower hand. I need some money, Abu Usama, I need some money for me to come to one of you, my brother in Islam, with sincerity, I need some money. I'm going to ask this brother or any one of you, can you give me some money? And I really have an issue, I'm in need. For him to give me the money, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. Doesn't mean the lower hand is in the knob and the upper hand is in the Jannah. But the one who was given, as the Nabi said, Khayrukum and Fa'akum Linnas. The best of you is the one who brings benefit to the people. So if the upper hand of the Muslim is better than the lower hand of the Muslim, he's in a better condition, what do you think is the reality of the Muslim who has to take welfare from non Muslims? And he's okay with that. Laziness is a big problem. And the Nabi was against it. First issue concerning laziness that I want to bring to your attention, inshallah, is if you were to look in the Quran from the beginning to the end, you will find there are only two ayats of the Quran in which laziness is mentioned. And in both ayat, it's a description for the hypocrites. In one of those ayats, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يُخَادِئُونَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ خَادِعُهُمْ وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَىٰ صَلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالًا يُرَاؤُونَ النَّاسَ وَلَا يَفْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا The hypocrites, they try to fool Allah. They're not real believers. They think that they're fooling Allah. They're not real believers. They're here to spy. They're here to make trouble. Allah knows their reality, even if the people don't. They try to fool Allah. But in reality, Allah is fooling them by allowing them to remain in that condition. It said when they stand up for salat, they stand up in salat for salat in a lazy way. And they only show off to show the people that they're praying, but they don't remember Allah except a little bit. Only two ayat of the Quran in which laziness mentioned and both of them describe the munafiqeen. So that's a clear indication and a clear sign that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the religion of Islam is against the Muslim being lazy and procrastinating. It's a problem. Procrastinating when it comes to making tawbah. There's not a single person here except that he or she is engaged in making big mistakes. And a lot of mistakes at that. The person says, I'm going to make tawbah when I reach the age of 40. I'm going to make tawbah after I do this particular thing. I'm going to make tawbah this time and that time. When in reality, if you were to read the Quran, the prophets and the messengers were human beings, all of them. They made mistakes, like every human being makes mistakes. The only person is, the only one who is flawless and mistakeless is Allah Azawajal, only. But you'll find that the prophets and the messengers, when they made mistakes in the Quran, they made tawbah immediately after making that mistake in the story in which their mistake was mentioned. So the munafiqeen are the people who are lazy. As it relates to the conduct and the akhlaq of the Prophet, he used to make dua to Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in many different ways, many different dua, different variations. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al azi wa a'udhu bika min al kasal Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from being incapable and unable. I want to do something, but for one reason or another, maybe that reason is for me and maybe it's from influences that are outside of me. 
I seek refuge in you from being incapable and unable, and I seek refuge in you from being lazy. He used to seek refuge in Allah from that. An example of his good akhlaq and laziness is not from good akhlaq. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was collected by Imam al-Tirmidhi, described the Nabi and one of the mundane issues connected to him. Something we take for granted. He said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his observation, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَسْرَعَ مَشْيَةً مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَأَنَّمَا الْأَرْضُ تُطْوَى لَهُ He said, I never saw anyone who walked faster and more briskly and more quicker than the Nabi. When he used to walk, it was as if the earth was being folded up towards him and for him. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, they said, كَانَ إِذَا مَشَى تَكَفَّأَ If he used to walk, he used to walk as if he was going down a hill. The reason why he walked like that, and he didn't lollygag. Some people when they walk, and if this is your nature, as it is my nature, don't like walking fast. My wife, she likes walking fast. I always have to tell her, hey lady, lady, slow down. I don't like walking fast. So, I can't walk fast. My wife has the pram, and I say, come on, come on, come on, it's the sunnah, it's the sunnah. I'm not saying that. The nature of the Nabi is that he used to walk fast. Why? Because he had something to do. He had to save time. He had a focus. He had something that he was trying to accomplish. Anything that came remotely close to indicating any aroma of laziness, he used to stop it. He was in his majlis, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And a man was yawning, yawning. And when he was yawning, he opened up his mouth and he made a sound. Ah. And he didn't close his mouth. The Prophet told that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kuffa Anna Jusha'aka, Fa Inna Aktharahum Jo'ing Yomul Qiyama Atwalahum, Fa Inna Aktharahum Shaba'ing Yomul Qiyama Aktharahum Atwalahum Jo'ing Yomul Qiyama. Hey, hey, you, hold back that yawning from us. Don't yawn like that in our presence. Whoa, don't do that. He said, because. The people who eat the most in the dunya and they're full as a result of eating, Yom al Qiyamah, they're going to be the hungriest people. So, if a person, the hadith shows us the reason why the man was yawning is a result of overeating. And if the person overeats, he's going to be lazy. And the way our culture is Africans, Arabs, Asians, Muslims, the way our culture is is that we cultivate our children on bad diets and bad eating habits. And as a result of that, we help to instill in them laziness. Two weeks ago in one of my classes with the younger people of my community, I told some of the young people, stand up and tell me something great that you consider concerning your father. This one said, my father, he lifts weights and he has a lot of muscles. That one said, my father over there, my father, he can do this, he can do that. That one said, my father, he did this, he did that. One of them said, my father, he can eat eight chapatis. In the mind of the kid, that's a sign of manliness. The Nabi told the people, us, the best people is the generation that I was sent to. And then the one that comes after them. And then the one that comes after them. The best generations of the first 300 years of Islam. He said, and then there are going to come a group of people who will bear witness before they were requested to bear witness. And they'll make promises that they don't keep and they will be fat. They will be overweight. So the best of the community, the companions, they were not people who were overweight. People towards the latter times our people will be overweight. So the point here is that the Nabi told that man, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, hold back that yawning from us, because it's a sign and indication that the man overate. So the point here is from the good akhlaq of the Nabi, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is he had what is known as alu al himma, high determination. He had things to do. He did not busy himself with some of the frivolous things that we find important. And in describing Allah, he said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Inna Allah 
yuhibbu ma'ali al-umur wa yakrahu sifsafaha Allah loves that you engage yourself in high exalted affairs and he hates Allah hates that you engage yourself in frivolous matters frivolous matters like in the NBA finals or in the playoffs who's winning between the Miami Heat and the other team it's not important issues like some of our shabab the young men being on the PlayStation and the time and the effort and the attention that we give to that that's frivolous there was a man sitting down doing the time of the Nabi he was plucking a rock he was plucking a rock just passing time wasting time plucking the rock the Nabi came to him and said don't do that because it's not going to help you with jihad it won't help you to know how to defend yourself it's not like it's not like shooting and learning how to shoot or riding your animal and learning something that's going to be practical in helping you in your life skills he said and also plucking the rock is going to knock someone's eye out or break someone's tooth he didn't like the people to be engaged with issues like that although it's okay to enjoy your life and just to rest and take it easy and have a picnic so don't get it twisted I'm not here to say you can have a good time I'm not saying that but the point that we're trying to make is Allah he loves those issues that are exalted like putting on a conference like this the volunteers and the brothers who got behind this thing this right here it just didn't happen haphazardly it was because a group of brothers and sisters came together and they made it happen you didn't have anything to do with the process I didn't have too much to do with the process but it came as a result of efforts of people and not everyone can do it Allah loves that you engage yourself Allah, with trying to memorize Jews Amma Allah loves that you try akhi, to get a degree in your particular field of study Allah loves that you memorize 40 hadith Allah loves that you make jihad against yourself and rectify the problems, the static and the drama that's between you and your mother, your father, or your auntie. Allah hates those affairs that are irrelevant, those affairs that are frivolous. The Nabi always encouraged people, don't be lazy. Be of the people who are in the forefront. And what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, and Mustafa and Mukhtar, salawatullahi wa salamu he told the people then and he told us لو يعلم الناس ما في النداء والصف الأول ثم لم يجدوا إلا أن يستهموا عليه لاستهموا عليه ولو يعلمون ما في التهجير لاستبقوا إليه if the people only knew the virtues and the benefit in a person given the adhan and he has to be in the masjid first to be muadhan he can't be the guy who comes late. He's the guy who's praying in the last row. He missed one rock out, two rock out, three. He can't be the mu'adhin. He has to be there early. If the people only knew the reward of giving the adhan, when he gives the adhan, every ant, every roach, every mouse, every rat, every human being, every jinn, every angel, Yom al will come bear witness to that dawah. I'm giving dawah right now. I hope Allah accepts it for me and you. The one who gives the adhan is giving da'wah Allah. Yawm al-Qiyamah, the one who gives the adhan will have the longest neck. Why is that important? Some now Muslims will say, longest neck? I don't want a long neck. When the person is standing there and the people are in sweat, up to their ankles, up to their knees, up to their waist, up to their chest, up to their shoulders, if he has a long neck, he has more to be submersed in. If the people only knew the virtues of the adhan, and the first row being in the first row go to any masjid I made the khutbah and the masjid here and every masjid of the Muslims is basically the same when the Imam comes and he says assalamu alaikum the masjid is always less than half full so if the people only knew what's in the adhan and in praying in the first row and the only way that they can determine who's going to do those two things was by drawing lots, then they would do that. And if the people only knew the virtues of coming to the masjid early, then they would race to do it.
That hadith is an example of the Nabi wasallam pushing you, pushing me. Even the lady who doesn't go to the masjid necessarily is his way of telling us, don't be of the people who are just satisfied with mediocrity. Don't be of those people. In America, I don't know what the system here is in Canada. In the academic spectrum, you can get an A, B, C, D, or an F. Some parents, if the child just gets a C, they say, okay, alhamdulillah, he has a C. Some of the students are like that, the way the Muslim thinks. If I get a C, alhamdulillah, I didn't fail. No, the Muslim, he has to shoot for higher than that. And then if he winds up getting a C, she gets a C after giving all of the effort that they had, tried their level best, all they got was a C, alhamdulillah. But the point is, he doesn't start off saying, I just want to see. The Muslim, he has to have ulul himma, high determination. So the way our lifestyle is and the way we give tarbiyah, parents, how are you complaining about your child? He's lazy, he's lazy, he's lazy. Well, he's looking at his mother and his father. I told you, when they asked our mother Aisha, al Khumaira, Um Abdullah, how was the Prophet's character? She could have easily said he would have good character. She didn't say that. She said a, some kalam that came as a result of the jawamil kalam that she used to see from him. The way he expressed himself and articulated himself. Any Arab would tell you the way the Nibi talked, although he was a human being, he had what is known as jawamil kalam. He said a few words, but they have far-reaching implications. His companions were like that, especially his wives, Aisha. His akhlaq was the Qur'an. She was affected by the close relationship she had with him. You're complaining as a parent about your child being an underachiever. You're lazy, you're this, you're that. Look at the example that was given to the child. He saw his father like that. He saw you, the mother was like that. When we prayed, he saw when we prayed Salatul Fajr, it was always after the sun came up. The five prayers, the mother and the father didn't show this kid, hey, the best deed is making salat on its proper time, at its proper time. The kid, he saw that all of his life is going to become part and parcel his Islamic identity. So what can we do in order to not be people who are lazy? What did the Quran and the Sunnah say about tackling laziness and procrastination? I'm going to wear hijab, but after I graduate and I get a job, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make toba. Before I give you some practical examples, some important things that come from the Kitab and the Sunnah, let me just say that there's a story in the Quran, Surah Yusuf. This story of um, this issue of procrastinating comes in that story. Very quickly, in the beginning of the story, they decided to kill Yusuf or throw him away. They said amongst themselves, Qalu uqtulu Yusuf. They said amongst themselves, We should kill Yusuf or throw him off in a far distant land. And after we do that, after we commit that sin, then we're going to be righteous people. But let's first do this. Let's disobey Allah first. And then we're going to make toba. The story went on. That's the beginning of the story. The story went on. I can't go through the whole story, obviously. At the end of the story, when Yusuf was in Egypt and he had position, he told one of the workers, put the vessel of the king in the saddle of my younger brother, Benjamin and check all of my brother's saddles and come to Benjamin's last. When they came to Benjamin's saddle and they found the vessel of the king, Benjamin didn't steal. Yusuf said, someone stole from amongst you. They said, we didn't come here to steal, you know that. But since you found it with him, they said, in Yasrit, if he did steal, then he had a brother who used to steal before meaning Yusuf. They're lying. If he, deals, if he stole, he stole this vessel. He had a brother who used to steal before. 
and Yusuf kept it to himself. He didn't tell them about the reality. What happened to the Toba at the beginning of the story? That's the nature of, of, that's the nature of sinning. Person says, I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Later, I'm going to, more than likely you're not going to do. Don't press, procrastinate, do it today. Great scholar of Islam from the Tabi'in, Al Imam Al Hassan Al Basri. He said, This dunya that we're living in, it is three days. This whole dunya, your whole life, constitutes three days. Yesterday, that's in the past. Yesterday and what happened yesterday. Some people pray, some people make zina, some people stole, some people make riba, some people, some people, some people. It's gone. He said, And tomorrow is your dunya tomorrow but you haven't been promised that come in here we almost had a serious accident come in here i'm not talking about a small accident we almost had a serious accident walking across the street you can be hit by the car anything can happen tomorrow and you haven't been promised that so don't say i'm going to i'm going to a sweep and the third day is today today do what you can do today take advantage of today don't say tomorrow. So what are some of the practical issues that we can do that comes from the one who was on a high level of akhlaq? Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Ummatil Islam, I'm going to tell you. At the top of the list, number one, out of all the things I can mention. Look, I just didn't say like this at the top of the list. I just didn't do like this. I just didn't do like this. I got on my tippy toes. And if I didn't be afraid, if I wasn't afraid of getting on the chair to emphasize I would get on this table. What can we do? At the top of the list, pray Salatul Fajr on time. Pray Salatul Fajr on time, Ummat al-Islam. You young brothers and sisters, something is wrong with the Islam of a person who claims to be a Muslim and he's not praying five times a day. Something is wrong with that equation. Wallahi, the one who doesn't pray, he doesn't have true iman. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you wake up in the morning, everyone has three knots tied on the back of his neck. If he wakes up and he mentions Allah's name, he makes the dhikr of Allah. Alhamdulillah. One of those knots is taken off. When he gets up and he makes wudu, the proper wudu, the second knot is taken off. When he prays, the third knot is taken off. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he doesn't pray Fajr at all, then his, his nafs is going to be lethargic. He's going to be lethargic within his nafs. Now, if a person never prays Fajr, he won't be able to distinguish what's lethargic and what's not lethargic. It's just his life and he doesn't realize it. A person who his parents grew him up from day one, six years old, five years old, he's been praying. Now he's 20, 25, 30. All his or her life, they've been praying. When they miss Salatul Fajr, that individual, they feel off key. They feel discombobulated. They lost their equilibrium because the Salat is a part of who they are and who they were. The Nabi used to make a dua to, the, to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. Oh Allah, bless my ummah in the first part of the day. Put the barakah in their efforts in the first part of the day. Lo anna kum tawakaltum ala Allahi la razaqakum kama yarazaqu tayyir. If you people really, really depended on Allah, the true tawakal, Allah would provide for you the way He provides for the bird. The bird goes out early in the morning and he's hungry. And he comes back later in the day and he's full. As for the Muslim, he sleeps all day, all morning. 12 o'clock he wakes up. Mm, he says to his wife, you didn't cook. No, I didn't cook because you don't work. You didn't bring any food. You're not contributing. The Muslim has to be more on top of his program. At the top of the list, you want to kill laziness? Get up early in the morning, even if you don't work. And don't get up early in the morning just to get up, because this is a beautiful area. This is the first time that I came to Vancouver, and I'm amazed and in awe at the aesthetic nature of this place. I went to Victoria, and I flew that plane, and it was all just amazing. 
The only thing that's missing is my queen. I wish my queen was here so we could have rolled that plane together because when I got on the plane, the people were nervous when they saw me getting on the plane. They thought there was going to be a problem. Especially after I told them I want to sit next to the pilot. I want to see what's going on. I want to take pictures. It's a beautiful place. He gets up early in the morning to make Salatul Fajr. Another practical advice. You don't want to be lazy, then everybody has to work out. You young brothers, this sheikh right here, the sheikh with his leg crossed, my uncle, all of you, all of us, you have to work out, sister. You had a baby, two babies, three babies, and you gained some weight, alhamdulillah, no problem. My babies did that to my wife. She's still beautiful. She's still beautiful. My children did that to her. But it doesn't mean that she has to leave herself. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best generation, the one that I came, and then the one after that, and then the one after that, 300 years. And then after that, some people are going to come big stomachs, eat chapatis, overeating. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the people in an authentic hadith, Ma mala'a adamiyun in sharra min batnihi the worst vessel that a human being can fill up a cup any vessel the worst vessel that a person can fill up is his stomach if he has to eat a lot if he has to then let him eat a third of food a third for the drink a third for the air the way we are is we eat for seven intestines as the Nabi said, the kafir and the munafiq, they eat for seven intestines. The believer, he eats for one. And that one intestine, that one, he eats as he said. Just a few morsels of flesh to keep his back straight. So we have to work out. When you work out, there are some endorphins that are released, chemicals that make you want to get up and go. They make you feel better. They make you sleep better. Didn't the Nabi say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and mu'min al-qawi khayrun wa ahabu ila Allahi min al-mu'min al-da'if wa fi kullin khayr The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah and it's talking about physical strength The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer and both of them have good The strong believer if someone came to attack his mother, his wife his child, he's going to be there to defend them. He's not going to say, yeah, hoya, go ahead, do you, de deal with the situation, ummi, deal with the problem. He's not going to say that. The one who is strong has the ability to go out and work, and he comes to the masjid, and he's giving sadaqah. The weak one, he can't do anything, can't defend himself. He's heavy on the people. Allah told Yahya, Ya Yahya, Yahya, take the book and be strong. Be strong. Be on your religion. People come, they have something to say. Intellectually, they're terrorizing the Muslims in the university, in this community, the papers, the media. They want to make us appear as if we're a way that we're not. Our religion is a way that it's not. No, the Muslims are going to be strong concerning that. When, when I say strong, I don't mean ignorant, extreme. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who don't bite their tongues and don't speak out of the side of their necks. They defend themselves. They de defend the religion. So I'm encouraging all of you. You older men, you have to work out. That doesn't mean for you younger brothers that Abu Sam is condoning lifting weights and shooting steroids. I'm not telling you to shoot steroids. I'm telling you take care of your cardiovascular. You want to lift weights and get strong? No problem. But this is a difference between steroids and all of that. Sister, watch what you're eating and how you're eating and work out. You want to know some practical advices concerning being lazy? Then consider, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amatullah. Consider what Al Islam has said about the time. Islam has mentioned a lot about the time. 
a lot, not a little, a lot. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah, wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghadan. O you who believe, fear Allah, and let every soul look forward to what it has sent forth for tomorrow. Pay attention to that time. The Nabi, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ni'matan maghboonun fihima kathirun min al-naas. There are two ni'mas that Allah gave people, two favors that Allah gave people. Many people are losers in these two things. He said, good health and free time. Free time. Free time. You're young now. You don't have a lot of responsibilities. So now is the time to do the things that are going to help you in the future. If, if, and the if that I'm talking about is not the if that's haram, as if I can change the qadr. The qadr is the qadr. If I had the opportunity to turn the hand of time back, I wouldn't have been a knucklehead academically. I was a knucklehead. But Allah gave me another chance. I went to Medina and I excelled academically. But in America, I was a knucklehead trying to be cool. A knucklehead. You are he, don't be a knucklehead, sister. Don't be an underachiever. Or you're going to be a person who, the job that you're going to have after two or three years, you're going to be flipping burgers and Burger King or McDonald's, irregardless of whether Burger King halal haram. I'm not talking about that. Take advantage of the time right now. Allah's Prophet told the people about the time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la tazul. When you're standing before Allah, your feet are not going to move. You're not going to move Yom al until Allah asks you about four things. And the very first thing the Prophet mentioned, he's going to ask you about your life. What did you do with it? How did you spend it? He told the people, Take care of five things. Take advantage of five things before five things happen. One of those things, take care of your free time before you become busy. Take care of your youth before you become old. While you're young, fast, pray, do those things because the time may come you may be praying sitting down. Time may come when you can't go to Umrah and Hajj. Time may come when you can't do certain things. So now that you're young, now that you're free, take advantage of time. You want to kill laziness, manage laziness, then consider what Islam said about the time. Seriously? I only, I'm still in the introduction. <laughs> salat, salat. As salat, as salat, wa ma malakat imanukum. I want to end here with a quick word of advice to our young brothers and our young sisters. Inshallah ta'ala. We have to be balanced. Please don't anyone sit there thinking that I'm being judgmental that I'm speaking to you guys in a condescending way. I'm better than you. I'm in Jannah, you in the Nar. It's just I'm passionate. That's how I talk. Don't think for one minute or fraction of a second that I'm telling you you can't enjoy your youth. I'm not saying that. And the religion didn't say that. But what I am saying is if you want to kill laziness, then you have to have some tartib in your life. You have to organize yourself. Don't be a person who gets up every day and you don't know what you're going to do in that day. You have some vague ideas about what you're supposed to do, but you should get up every day with a checklist. I have to accomplish A, B, C, D, and E. And you have to make tartib. The mother has to make tartib. Everyone. Because that's from the sunnah of the Nabi. Not only that, the ibadat of al-Islam are like that. Unfortunately, when it's time for the salat, we have no discipline in the masajid. The imam, he's making salah and the people are racing the imam. If he makes sajda, there are people who make sajda at the same time with him. When he gets up, people get up. 
The ibadat of al-Islam are teaching us about being people who have discipline. When you go to hajj with a show of hands, your right hands, how many of you have been to hajj? Put your hands up, your right hand if you went to hajj. How many of you, please, please, put your hand up. Okay, put your hands down, you hujjaj. How many of you have not put to, been to hajj? Put your right hands up. Masakeen. Oh Allah, Allah, help them to make hajj. Oh Allah, make it easy for them to make hajj this year. Hey guys, say ameen. Oh Allah, help them to make hajj. When you do go to hajj, physically, you have to do a lot of stuff. You can't be lazy. You have to walk, as these pilgrims will tell you. You have to walk from Mina. You have to go to Arafah. You have to go to Muzdalifah. You have to walk back to Mina. You have to do this. You have to make tawaf. You have to make sa'i. You can't be lazy. You can't sit in the tent at Mina and say, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to go today. You can't do that. You have to get up and move. Physically. But you have to do it at a particular time and a particular way. That's Islam telling you, one of the lessons of Hajj, telling you, organize yourself. Organize yourself. You can't do the ibadat of al-Islam when you want, how you want. No, you have to do them with tartib. The Prophet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ عَمَلٍ شِرَّةً وَلِكُلِّ شِرَّةً فَتْرَةً فَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَتُهُ إِلَى السُنَّةِ فَقَدْ اِحْتَدَى وَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَتُهُ إِلَى غَيْرِ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ هَلَكَ For every action that you do, every action, there is a time of being active and enthused, and there's a time of being lethargic and tired. He said, whoever, when he becomes lethargic and tired, he does so in accordance and towards my sunnah, he'll be guided aright. But when a person, when he becomes lethargic and tired and lazy, is towards other than my sunnah, he'll be destroyed. The meaning of that very quickly is, there's a big sheikh, he came from somewhere, he's going to teach an Imam al-Bukhari. Everyone's going to come for the first class, second class, third class. We're very enthused, we're active. After the fourth, fifth, sixth week of learning Quran or whatever, you see the students start falling off because now the inactivity and the laziness sets in. It's natural. He says, so when you become tired, if it is in accordance to my sunnah, you still come, but you may not be in the first row. You may not come, but you get the notes from someone. Your inactivity is still towards the sunnah. You, you're guided. But when he becomes tired, then he'll be destroyed. Meaning, when he becomes tired, he goes and he wastes time watching what's haram. Wasting time surfing the internet and what's haram. Waste time with qila wa qal and namima and ghiba. He wastes time with doing what's haram. The hadith is showing us that the Nabi knew the nature of the people. There's a time of being active and inactive. There's a time going out, having a good time with your family, giving Allah's rights, giving your family the rights, and giving yourself the rights. No problem. But you can do that without being lazy. Ummat al-Islam, you young brothers and sisters, organize yourselves, inshallah, in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be pleased with you. And remember, the time is like a sword, a sharp knife. If you don't cut it and you don't take advantage of it, it's going to cut you. And you can replace everything in this dunya. You lose your arm, go get a prosthetic arm. Get replaced. Your heart, you can get it replaced. Your mother or your father. If they die, it can be replaced. After time, you're going to have the resilience to bounce back. And that pain is going to leave you. As a matter of fact, your wife's mother is going to become like your second mother. Your auntie, your mother's sister is going to become like your mother and take that place. But there's one thing in this dunya you will not be able to get back. You can't replace it. And that's those seconds that have passed us by in this talk. And yesterday, and the day before yesterday, and the day before that, and the year before that. They're not coming back. So cut the time before it cuts you. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته